My name is Francesco Bova. I'm an associate professor at the Rotman School of Management. Uh, I'm also an academic lead for uh, CDL's Toronto site. Uh, Creative Destruction Lab is a program that takes seed stage startups and helps to make them massively scalable. Over the last four years, I've also been the lab economist and the moderator for CDL's Quantum Stream. And through that time, we have had almost 100 uh, ventures come through the program that have looked at commercializing quantum tech. And with that as a backdrop, I'd like to discuss today what every leader should know about quantum computing. And so before we start discussing quantum computing, I think it's just important to understand uh, or benchmark it against what, a, what kind of a classical computer looks like. And these are the computers that we use every day. Uh, the foundation of a classical computer is a bit, right? So this is bi it's binary, it takes a value of zero or one. Uh, classical computers are deterministic and can solve a wide variety of problems. So let's take a look at look at a problem that, that we might want to use a classical computer for. And so I've got this pictorial here. And so for every little square here, you can think of those squares as a light switch. And if the light switch is turned on, the square will be colored white. If the light switch is turned off, the square will be colored black. Okay. And so we can think about all the possible combinations of on or off for a given number of light switches. Okay, so if there's only one light switch, there's there's two combinations, right? The light switch can either be on or off, two to the power of one equals two. If there's two light switches, uh, there are, are two to the power of two possible combinations or four combinations, right? The light switches can either be on and off, on and on, off and off, or off and on, and so on and so forth, right? If we go to three possible light switches, that's two to the power of three. Uh, that equals eight possible combinations and so on and so forth. So a classical computer that's uh, based on a foundation of bits uh, can go through all of the possible combination of light switches being on or off for a comparatively small number of light switches in a reasonable amount of time, right? But if we go up to a number like 256, so let's say that we've got 256 light switches, all the possible combinations of on or off would take a classical computer uh, in some cases, uh, millions of years to go through every possible combinations. Okay, so this is a, a type of problem or a type of exercise that is intractable for current classical computers, the computers that we use every day. Okay, so let me let me use that as a benchmark here. Let's move now on to quantum computers. Quantum computers, unlike classical computers, are not deterministic, they're probabilistic. Uh, and they're not based on a foundation of bits, they're based on a foundation of qubits. So bits take a value of either zero or one. Qubits can take a value between zero and one, right? So they're based on probabilities. Quantum computers make use of quantum effects like superposition and entanglement and quantum parallelism. And if we get a sufficiently large fault tolerant quantum computer uh, running a quantum algorithm, they can speed up the process of going through every iteration or, or path, uh, for example, like, like the problem that we had here. Right? So whereas a classical computer, it would take uh, a classical computer millions of years to go through every iteration of on or off for our light switch example, if there's 256 light switches, a quantum computer that's sufficiently large and fault tolerant can go through that process in a much more timely manner, maybe with a couple of weeks, maybe a month, maybe even a couple of days if it's sufficiently large. And this is the value proposition of quantum computing. We've got these massively intractable problems in science and in business that classical computers cannot solve. And a, a sufficiently coherent quantum computer that's fault tolerant running specific algorithms may be able to solve them in a timely manner. So it's an incredible value proposition. Uh, we're not there yet though, right? So we do not have a fault tolerant quantum computer at this time. Quantum computers are incredibly sensitive to noise. Uh, so error correction is very important for quantum computers. It's a, it's a comparatively easy problem to solve for classical computers. Very tough problem to solve for quantum computers. In fact, we haven't done it yet. Uh, quantum computers need to be in very sterile environments to operate. So uh, for example, some of the architectures need to be cooled to almost absolute zero to be able to function, right? So that very different than let's say our laptops, which can be run just about anywhere. Uh, quantum computers face innovation from classical approaches. So if you think about the market for quantum computers, kind of classical computers can be viewed as the incumbent and the, and the quantum computers can, can be viewed as kind of the innovative new entrant. Uh, well, it's not like classical computers are remaining static. They're looking at the innovations in quantum and creating quantum inspired algorithms that can be run classically today that also speed up classical computers, right? So it's a, so it's a dynamic market. And so again, we're currently working in this era of noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. 
We currently don't have a fault tolerant quantum computers, but there are companies that are application based that are making use of this noisy technology today. And they're doing this in one of two ways. They're either uh, experimenting with current noisy hardware and generating quantum inspired algorithms that can be run classically today that can lead to speed ups today, or they are creating hybrid solutions where classical approaches solve part of a problem and quantum computers solve the other part of the problem. And these companies are generating value today. So what are the applications for quantum computing? This is a very small subset of applications for quantum technologies in general. Uh, the area that I'll focus on is, is optimization. And you could think of, of this as the kind of the classical traveling salesperson problem uh, where you've got a salesperson that needs to travel to a finite number of cities to sell their product. And uh, you know they, could, they can take whatever path they want. They'll generate the same amount of revenue, but they want to find the shortest route across all five of the cities because taking the shortest route will minimize the costs. So they start in their home city. They need to, to visit all of the cities once and they need to end up in, in the city that they started in. And, uh, and this will minimize their costs while achieving the same re revenue and ultimately maximizing profits. So again, much like our light switch example, this is a comparatively easy problem to solve for classical computing if there's a small finite number of cities, right? So if we've only got five or 10 cities, a, a classical computer can go through all of the, the potential routes from the home city through all the other cities and then end up back in the starting point um, and they can do that in, in a reasonable amount of time and find the shortest route. But much like our light switch example, right, for every city that we add to the problem, uh, solving the problem, going through every single route to find the shortest route becomes an exponentially harder problem to solve. By the time that we get to a million cities or a couple of million cities, this, this problem may become intractable for current classical technology. And this is where quantum computers may be able to provide a little bit more traction, right? They can provide solutions for these massively intractable optimization problems. Um, other applications too in simulation. So for companies that are that are looking at materials discovery and are trying to uh, simulate, for example, what, what, a, what a molecule looks like uh, before they, synth before they, they uh, synthesize the molecule, um, uh, quantum may also be making inroads there and a number of other verticals as well. So let's talk about optimization. So uh, uh, as, as the title suggests, quantum computing holds promise for, for banks and the financial sectors. Uh, you know, the financial sector in general has a number of massively intractable optimization problems that they have to deal with. Uh, uh, you know, problems in the area of credit scoring, uh, problems in the area of foreign exchange arbitrage, and of course, problems in the area of portfolio optimization. So let me illustrate some work that one of our alumni companies has done. So this is a company called Multiverse Computing. They graduated from CDL Quantum uh, a couple of years ago and do work at the intersection of finance and quantum computing. So they've got domain expertise in both finance and quantum computing. Uh, they are platform agnostic and they are trying to generate innovations using kind of our existing current noisy quantum technology. And so they've worked on this portfolio optimization problem jointly with a bank based out of Spain. So the bank gave them historical return data for 50 different assets and, and asked them to come up with the optimal portfolio returns, uh, given that they could rebalance a portfolio uh, every day over an entire year. So they've got a, a trading window where they could rebalance their portfolio every day for an entire year, uh, subject to a number of constraints. So number one, they were only allowed to invest in five different assets at a time. Uh, there was a minimum holding period. Anything they invested in uh, needed to be held on to for a seven-day period. And the, the resulting portfolios had to be bounded uh, for certain risk parameters, right? So, the, so uh, the portfolios couldn't be excessively volatile, okay? So this is, a, this is a computationally challenging problem, right? And this is a problem that grows exponentially more difficult to solve with every new asset class that we include and with every new trading day that we include to the problem. Uh, and so here were the results that that uh, that Multiverse came up with, uh, running a hybrid approach. They used a classical approach, and they combined their classical approaches with uh, with a quantum annealer, the D-Wave, a piece of, of quantum tech for a company called D-Wave, uh, and D-Wave is based out of Vancouver. Uh, and here were the portfolio results that they were able to achieve that are risk adjusted relative to a random sample of portfolio results. Right. So not only did they improve on this random sample 
but I, I believe that they also improved on uh, the portfolio returns that could be generated using commercial classical solvers that the bank was already using. Okay, and so these are some just simply massive problems. This result was featured in The Economist. And so one of the problems that, that they ran was big enough that there were 10 to the power of 13,000 different rebalancing strategies that could be employed. Okay, so how big is that number? That number is bigger than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So this is a simply massive number of potential rebalancing strategies. And, uh, and Multiverse was able to come up with solutions um, you know, within a couple of minutes using their D-Wave hybrid solver. And these solutions uh, did better than a, than a random sample and better than the bank could do on their own. Okay, so here are some examples. So let me finish off with my final slide by, by noting what every leader should know about quantum computing and what they should be thinking about as we're living in this era of noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And so this is particularly salient to those leaders who face some sort of intractable computational problem. Right, so these aren't just problems in finance. These also could be problems in logistics, right? The, south, the, the traveling salesperson problem is essentially a logistics problem. This could be problems in advanced manufacturing. This could be uh, problems in computational chemistry. Here's what I, what I would suggest. The first is education, okay? So there are a number of programs available out there for, for, for business people with no domain expertise in quantum. Uh, that can give them insights into quantum and, and talk a bit about the value proposition of quantum computing. We offer at CDL, we offer the simple economics of quantum computing lecture as well. Uh, I would encourage them to experiment with quantum hardware. Again, many of our application companies have generated innovations simply by experimenting with the current hardware that's available to them. Right? In some cases, they've generated uh, quantum-inspired algorithms that can be run classically. In other instances, they've generated hybrid solutions, uh, as, as our, our alumni at Multiverse uh, did in the finance space. And then finally, consider working with quantum startups on pilots. Uh, we've got a very vibrant ecosystem here in Canada of, uh, of quantum startups, of domain experts who are looking to commercialize their ideas. It's, it's great for the startups. It allows them to illustrate the efficacy of their technology we're using real world data. And it's also great for the companies that engage in the startups, right? So for example, again, the, the bank that worked with Multiverse for this portfolio optimization program, we're, we're able to generate innovations that were uh, superior to the ones that they were able to generate with their own technology. Uh, so that concludes my discussion for the day uh, and it highlights some of the things that we talk about in the current issue of the Rotman Magazine.